All right, and we are good. Tim Hinchy, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm great. How are you today? I'm really good. Uh, you're obviously coming from Colorado, back in Colorado now, been on the road for a few days. Yeah, I actually live in Denver, Colorado, so I commute down to the Springs when I'm in town. So, uh, But it's great to be home, and we had our first snow today. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Jeez. Uh, heavy or just light? Uh, pretty heavy this morning, uh, and it was heavy just because I was out doing my master's workout. We swim outdoor year-round, so always fun to swim in the snow. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm seeing by your name labeled here, there's three of you. There's two more before you, I guess. Yep. Uh, my grandfather, Timothy Sr., and uh, my dad, Timothy Jr., who's uh, still around. He lives in Northern California. Awesome. Awesome. That's cool. Very cool. Are you are you happy to kind of follow in their footsteps? A absolutely. Uh, very, very. My dad was my best man at my wedding. Uh, went to Notre Dame. They both went to Notre Dame. Uh, my dad was uh, very successful and uh, was in the Navy. Uh, it was a very tight ship growing up. So mm -hmm. uh, I, he, uh, he was, again, my best man at my wedding, still a great friend and loved him to death. But you're the third. that They went to Notre Dame. Why didn't you go to Notre Dame? You went to UC Irvine. What happened? Uh, there we go. Already with a tough question. So my dream, was, <laughs> my, my dream was to go to Notre Dame. I did not get accepted academically, um, mm. but, but I did go to see Tim Wells. She invited me out to see the team at the time and uh, was willing to help me walk on, which I thought was just why I love the guys so much. And, and, and we miss him already after his uh, departure this year. Uh, but uh, got accepted to UC Irvine academically. And when you grow up in Northern uh, California, anywhere in California, kind of the UC system is what they preach to you. So Berkeley, UCLA, Irvine, Santa Barbara, San Diego. So I was fortunate to get accepted to Irvine uh, and walked on uh, to that program uh, back in 1986. Beautiful. Well, great program. Unfortunately, it doesn't exist anymore. Right? Did they cut it just recently? No, I think Dave Durden ruined it. So I think yeah. that's probably that's probably what happened because it was great when I was there. So clearly, Durden screwed it up. Definitely, somehow. definitely yeah. Durden's problem. That's yeah. Totally his fault. <laughs> now let's just do a little bit of background. You have six kids. That's a phenomenal job there. Now you have twin boys. I have twin girls. Your your boys are what? Seventeen? Is that 16. right? Sixteen. 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 Yep. Okay. Identical. identical? Yep. 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 I got I got identical girls. So I've got you got you got about three years on me. What have I got to look forward to? Well, I tell you, I had three girls first, then identical mm. boys, and then another boy. So uh, I, I think you're wow. going to be you're going to be just fine. I, it's, what's interesting to me about them right now is as we just start to talk about college, I for mm. sure thought they'd want to go together, be together. No chance. They have like totally really? different, totally different interests. What wow. they want to study, totally want to go to different schools. So uh, it should be very interesting. But as you know, it's a, it's a tremendous blessing. That is interesting. Have they been um, close growing up? Like, you know, I mean, obviously the, the surprise of wanting to go to different schools, that's what I would imagine. My daughters, you know, we would put them in separate beds, say goodnight, turn the lights off, come back two minutes later and they'd be in the same bed together and like, all right, well, we should have done it that way in the, from the beginning. But yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Like in most cases, they've just been tremendous friends and buddies. And, and I, I just enjoy watching that. Right? I had one younger sister so to watch them have such a great friendship is great. I, just like you, they would they hang out. But at the same time, as they got a little bit older into their teenage years, they have definitely wanted to have kind of their own friend groups. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's been interesting to watch that. And then when they got to high school, out of middle school, and they started doing the same activities, then they kind of got back together with the same friend group, which has been fun. And then they both enjoy picking on their little brother. So I think that's yeah. what they shared yeah. the most yeah. in common. That's pretty pretty normal then. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to switch views here after this next question. I'm going to I'm going to put you on full full view. I want to see your face. But uh, all right, I'm going to ask the the dumb question from me. So you're the president and CEO. What's what's the difference in the roles at at USA Swimming? So when the governance changed back in 2017, which I inherited, I got here July 17th. Uh, they it used to be the executive director, if you will, was the CEO. That was the title they used, and the president was the board chair. When they codified the new governance, they simply made the board chair the board chair, and they gave the president CEO title to the CEO, which is probably more you know, uh, you know, consistent with what you have in the United States in terms of you know for folks that leave different businesses, especially in right. sports and entertainment. So I think they just did that just from a title perspective. And, and what does it mean to you though? Like in terms of the your your switching back and forth between the different hats, what do you have to do between the two roles? It's really one and the same. Like I said, it's just in most companies here in the U.S., president and CEO is, are, are just the same position. It's really not okay. a different position. So right. sometimes there are differences in different places. So for me, I'm the president and CEO of both the US, USA Swimming and then the USA Swimming Foundation. So we have two 5013 nonprofits that I oversee. 
We wow. have a we have a staff of about seventy three right now on the USA Swimming perspective, which is inclusive of the staff of the foundation. Mm. But they have two different missions, right? USA Swimming is the nonprofit youth serving sports organization that leads up to our Olympic team. That's the entire pipeline, kind of the elite swimming in the United States. Pre COVID, about four hundred thousand members across the U.S., all fifty states. And then the USA Swimming Foundation, which is kind of saving lives and building champions, is about really fundraising to create learn to swim opportunities and then to help support our Olympians. Oh wow, that's that's fantastic! You know, huge, huge deal in terms of learn to swim. I mean, um, couldn't be a bigger role in in terms of learning to swim and the size of America, and then kind of looking at. Um, you know, drownings and deaths and things like that. How are we looking? You know, like I know it was, there was a big push in Australia when I was living there to kind of get kids to learn how to swim just because we're surrounded by ocean. There's pools everywhere. Kids were drowning left and right. Um, what's it like in the U.S.? Well, from a pre-COVID perspective to start with, it's, it's still not great. I mean, 60% of African-Americans, 50% of Hispanic Americans, and 40% of Caucasian Americans, uh, kids do not know how to swim. All right. And, and really... That's why we're so you know, dedicated to this cause. And right now we partner with a lot of organizations across the country to try to kind of work together on this issue. And then, as you know, in the United States, because you, you're, you're obviously familiar, you live here. The reality is those 50 states are all very different. Some, to your point, mm -hmm. touch oceans, have rivers, have lakes. Right. Some have pools, some don't have pools. But regardless, it's still it's still epidemic. And it's, you know, it's the number one cause of unattended death right in our country for children. And so it's 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 an issue that we're not going to give up on and we're going to work harder on. Is Colin Jones working with USA Swimming on, in this aspect? Absolutely. In fact, he just joined our board of directors for the USA Swimming Foundation and had his first board meeting in person this past week in Miami. So he's a tremendous example. He tells a story. Mm -hmm. In fact, he and Elizabeth Beisel, who are both ambassadors and board members to uh, the foundation, got up on stage in Miami as we talked about our pledges and to raise money that night as a key message in addition to celebrating our phenomenal Olympic team. And he talks about that he almost died at age five, right? I mm -hmm. mean, and that's 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 unbelievable to have a, a, a star athlete like that almost lose his life to the same sport that he becomes an Olympic gold medalist. Uh, it tells a lot about what we need to be doing. Yeah, he's a good man. You, you got a good person involved there. He's, he'll definitely make some change. A lot of kids looking up to him too, you know, well, and, uh, right. and breaking those barriers too between, you know, the different communities trying to get kids to swim. Is there some sort of, uh, you know, financial burden that USA Swimming or the foundations and, and can take on in terms of the cost of, of learn, you know, learn to swim? Yeah, absolutely, Brett. We, so one of our, one of our main goals is to write $5,000 swim grants out to programs across the country, whether the USA Swimming members or not, they could submit proposals to us through our grant system. And, on, and, and in a pre COVID environment, we were averaging about $600,000 a year in distributions out to these different organizations uh, to create swim lessons of all kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, during COVID, one of, our, one of our great things that happened, and you know, from the beginning of COVID, we've been kind of, at least I was preaching to my staff and our organization to find your silver linings, right? Both professionally and personally. And a lot of us that were at home got to find some time with our families, which was a, a silver lining. On a professional level, we got to work on a couple of key projects that were kind of under the hood, if you will, under the boot, so to speak. And, and this gave us a chance to do that. One of which was uh, combining U.S. Master Swimming with USA Swimming underneath the umbrella of the foundation. Mm. So now, so now for the past year, for the first time ever, kind of the cradle to grave mentality of our sport, we're working together to not just raise money for learn to swim programs for youth, but now learn to swim programs for adults, which the Masters had started, mm. right? And oh. what we also learned for, from a percentage perspective, uh, the percentages are like you know seventy plus that if the adults in the household don't know learn how to swim, there's no chance that kids ever learn how to swim. So we, yep. need to, we need to approach it from both sides. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely that fear of water when it comes to adults. It's like, you know, if, I, if I'm fearful, I'm keeping my kids away from that, you know. So exactly. definitely that aspect, that education is going to be huge. Okay. Every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas. And I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout and save 10%. Now, I was looking through your bio. You, you spent time in the English Premier League. So were you kind of, did they kind of, um, you know, uh, 
create the whole episode of Ted Lasso around kind of <laughs> you a little bit? <laughs> I got it. It's probably because of my personality, because I'm a knucklehead. But the reality <laughs> is, uh, it's interesting because it's fun to watch those shows and fun to watch Jason. He does such a great job yeah, with the show. He does. And when I go, and when I go back and watch a whole bunch of movies that are UK movies, because my wife and I absolutely love our time in England. We have tremendous friendships we'll have forever from there. It was the best three years uh, I ever had. And we brought our five of our six kids got to live there and go to British mm. schools. And, but there's no doubt the vernacular uh, that we now know <laughs> the slang that we now know. I enjoy, I go back and watch all these old movies and I just, and, and Ted's last was an example. And it, yeah. when they use some of the slang, I'm like, Oh, I know what that means. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Good show. Yeah. I really got into that kind of just recently. It was fun, but um, so why did, why then, I mean, you're, you swam, you're, you're a swimmer, uh, but why did you want to take on this role? Why, why USA Swimming? What was the appeal? Well, I was, uh, I was in Dar at Darby County for three years, came back over, got recruited to Colorado Rapids in Major League Soccer, hmm. uh, which moved us to Colorado in the first place back in uh, late 2010 uh, and was CMO for a year and then was very fortunate to get pro uh, promoted to president and was there for five and a half years. So the world's game I played as well as a youth, not to the same uh, degree that I was uh, competing in swimming. It was a great experience. And in 2016, we had a phenomenal year as, as an organization. We made a lot of milestones. It was very, very rewarding, both personally and, and as an organization. So I was actually at the start of 2017, uh, negotiating a new contract to stay at the Colorado Rapids when a recruiter called me out of the blue about the swimming opportunity. And mm. to your point, you know, swimming has given me so much in my life. Again, I swam in college. I coached in college. I coached for Dave Sablo uh, at uh, Irvine Nova. Uh, I've coached masters. Uh, I volunteer coach today. Um, it's something that's in my blood. And for me to have an opportunity to give back to the sport that's given me so much was a no brainer. It was here in Colorado. Uh, and just a chance to try to take the baton from all the great things that Chuck and, and Mike had done and, and see if I could take it uh, to the next level is always a challenge that I'm willing to take. I love it. Well, just on that, you mentioned Mike. Mike was with USA Swimming as what the C COO for the past uh, few years at least. Uh, but he was with the organization for 28 years. He's now moved on to FINA. That, from what I'm hearing, that's that's a big loss for USA Swimming, right? Um, massive loss for USA Swimming. Uh, but Mike's legendary status and the legacies that have, he's created with us—you know, uh, Olympic trials, right in Omaha, and, mm. and, and the spectacle spectacle that's come. The relationship with NBC, Golden Goggles, which we got to recognize him this past Tuesday night. And I, I did my best effort to, to best effort to surprise him. And of course, Rowdy and I could not surprise him because he knows every detail <laughs> of everything that happens at USA Swimming. So yeah, he's finishing out his tour this uh, this month, but he's actually already in Abu Dhabi. And to be fair, he's probably now still helping USA Swimming, right? Going to FINA and being part of that change agent, which is happening with Brett Nowicki and, and Hussein Almasalam. Uh, they're focused on the athletes going forward. Mike is the perfect person. And when Brent asked for permission to speak to Mike in Tokyo, I had to give it. It was a great opportunity for Mike and for him to pursue a global a global challenge is something I know he's going to be exceptionally good at. Well, for someone that obviously has had such a huge impact on USA Swimming, I'm hearing that there's no real intention to replace his role. Is that correct? That's correct. Part of the thing I did when I first got here, my first mission was to really invest and surround uh, myself and the group with as much talent as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I call our senior executive team the strategy team. Uh, which is much different than what had, how the organization had been set up. We created four distinct business units, finance and operations, business affairs, commercial and technical. And at the time, Mike wasn't over technical. He, uh, so sport development and national team had different uh, executives at the time at USA Swimming, Pat Hogan and Frank Bush. So when I got to USA Swimming, as I was trying to get myself familiar with the organization with my intention to narrow this focus and this uh, uh, organizational chart, I asked Mike to oversee those. So he's really only in charge of those two things for a couple of years since he's been here. Uh, and then we, I promoted Lindsey Mantenko to take over the national team. Mm -hmm. We recruited Joel Shinnefield to come in to be the managing director of sport development. And so Mike still helped me oversee that for the past three and a half, four years, which has been great. But I was purposely putting these people in place to be prepared for Mike's departure because, again, whether that was uh, something great like this or if he chose his mind to do something else, I wanted to be prepared that the organization would be ready to take all of his great legacies and move them forward. So that was all purposeful. Right, right. Fair enough. I like it. Um, now I've, I've got, I've written some questions. So some of the stuff is just kind of like, 
out there in kind of the news right now. And then some of it is just of my interests. Um, I'm not a journalist, by the way, you know, I'm not, okay. <laughs> not, I'm not here to grill you either. And I'm not here to try and, uh, cause any controversy at all. That, no that's problem. not my intention. There's just questions that are obviously going around right now. So I wanted to get your perspective on some of these things. Um, what's the relationship with the ISL USA swimming in the ISL, you know, Swimming has moved into kind of a professional ranking and realm now. Uh, why is there no real association with USA Swimming and the ISL in that in that respect? Uh, we've met them with several several times before it even started. Uh, I had a chance to meet everybody. It was great. We're very supportive of the concept, and we've we've been supportive of our athletes since day one. And uh, even back when there was a little bit of controversy at the very beginning, we said <laughs> we would never we would never sanction our athletes. They have every right to go do this and and pursue their dreams on a professional level. So we think it's great. We have helped them uh, at the startup side with some operational and some medical things at the very beginning. Mike was instrumental in that. So mm -hmm. we were certainly there. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have our Olympic team and our national team. But really, as a 501c3 nonprofit, we are a youth-serving sport organization for the United States of America, right? So professional, for, so professional swimming is not within our remit. It's not something we're ever going to take over. So we're here to be supportive to our athletes, which our focus is on our athletes. Our focus is on our national team. Our, our focus is giving them every opportunity to compete everywhere they can. So we're happy for them. But again, our job is, again, of, of, at the time of those 350,000 athletes, the majority are under 18 years old, right? Some are in college. Mm -hmm. So the pro ranks is really not part of our remit or our focus. So we wish them well. We're going to give them everything they can to be supportive out of the national team division. Um, but ultimately that's, you know, that, that's not part of USA Swimming. That's interesting. I don't, I don't know where to go with that in terms of the questioning, but you know, one of the struggles that I had uh, as a college coach was, um, you know, I was responsible for the college team. I was paid, you know, by the college, but then I had a situation where it was obviously there was a need for, um, athletes to prolong their careers and, and a want to kind of represent their countries or whatever it was. Um, but there was no real bases for them you know like it was almost like there's this gap between a, a safe place to train where you can get quality coaching and and you know your all the attention's on you and then as soon as you leave college there's nothing for you in terms of what any type of real support and and this isn't a criticism of, of you i'm just trying to figure out where do we go in the future with pro athletes so obviously the 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 swimmer's age is extending now you know you had anthony Irvin in 16 win at 35 years old but there's no real place for pro athletes to go within usa swimming structure it's like you're either in you're stuck in this college system which isn't ideal because you you kind of there but you're not really welcome in a sense you know obviously they are but so you know what I'm saying is like sure. I, I mean, I, you've I, you've worked in in professional soccer, so it's like, how do we professionalize swimming within the U.S.? You know what I mean? Yeah, no. I, and again, I'll be honest, it's going to be difficult, right? You know, when you look at the landscape of professional sports, I go back to where we were in Major League Soccer uh, for for several years, and it struggled mightily before they got a CBA and four you know billion dollar owners came to the plate, right? And from a nonprofit perspective, we're not going to be a billion dollar owner. So what we've tried to do over time, and I certainly support what Mike and Lindsay and the team have done with our Tier Pro Series, where we've increased purses uh, pre-COVID, obviously, for our series to try to keep those swimmers in the water doing things. But if you take the soccer analogy, which I think is a good one, Brett, the reality is if, you, if I was U.S. soccer, right, which I had my national team, these are all professional athletes because they're all coming from professional clubs. So when mm -hmm. they're called into action for, our, for the U.S. soccer team, they have a calendar around the world. We all know what the global calendar is for U.S. soccer, right? We all know it. Mm -hmm. uh, MLS is a little bit different. Australia is a little bit different because of the seasonality. But the reality is the majority of the world's game is August to May. And then they, count, they create you know, windows of opportunity that we all have to respect for when the international friendlies or the international opportunities come together, right? So in the fall, you're going to have a weekend in September, October, and November that all the best athletes, if they get called back to their teams at the highest level of soccer, mm -hmm. are allowed to go back and join their national team and be patriotic and go compete for those opportunities, right? But then they come back to their club. So technically, they're always going to be the club's property, and then they're loaned back to the national team. Right, right. in our circumstance, in our country, again, when we're talking from under 10s to, to college age or beyond, 
when they're on the national team of USA Swimming, they are on a monthly stipend. We cover all their health benefits mm. and we continue to find ways to invest in their lifestyle so they can live and support themselves, which is also part of the foundation. Mind you, we try to work on those opportunities to obviously continue to increase our budgets there. You know, we're not, a, we're not an organization or a country that has government support whatsoever. So we have to go to the USOPC to find as much funding as possible just to pay for the uh, international opportunities we provide to our swimmers. The good news is, as an example, you know, this coming week in Abu Dhabi, we'll have 14 men and 14 women that we pay all the expenses for to get them mm -hmm. there safely and to train and to take care of them, bring medical staff, training staff, coaching staffs, and they have a chance to win a, a significant amount of money this week in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'll give you an example. Back in 2018, which was the first year that FINA really increased the short course world's monies, our team left with $478,000. And again, we pay for every expense to get there. We kept them safe. We fed them well, put them in a great hotel, made sure they were safe everywhere they go so they could create opportunities to win on an international scale. We're going to continue to do that as much as we possibly can. Find international opportunities, take care of them here domestically as much as we can, find new opportunities to help them. But when it comes to their fresh, professional careers, that's really up to them and their agents and the people they work with to determine what they'd like to do next. To your right. case, to your, but you make a great point about kind of the fall off afterwards where we need to get better, in my opinion. And we're already we're starting to work on this. And this new governance change now that was dictated by the United States federal government, where we have to have 33 and a third percent athlete representation on all of our governance uh, boards. So from our board of directors to all of our committees, et cetera, is great for USA Swimming, right? We have these tremendous athletes, world class athletes now that have the biggest voice they've ever had in the direction of USA Swimming and where they want us to take it and where they want us to support them. Right. Again, as a, as a nonprofit, we're dollar in, dollar out. Every dollar that comes into us goes right back into programmatic services or to our national team, point blank. And that's up on our 990s. That's a transparent uh, chance for people can jump on our website and see how the money gets moved around. I think where the biggest opportunity now is how do we help those athletes that don't want to be pros? Because I've met with a whole bunch of 10-year plus athletes, Olympic gold medalists that have mm. told me to my face, that it was, they're not sure that swimming was a net positive or negative in their life. And that's heartbreaking. Mm. That's heartbreaking to hear, right? Mm. So we need to find ways that maybe it's career development, maybe it's mentorship opportunities, maybe, right. it is prof maybe it is professional swimming. So we're very supportive of it. You know, we want all of our athletes to be successful. I, I had a chance to run into a whole bunch of golden goggles, obviously, and uh, talk to Ryan Murphy's of the world that came back and had a great time in ISL. So we want them to be successful. Uh, but at the same time, our focus is, uh, you know, the national team roster. And then eventually, obviously, supporting them for their Olympic dreams. There was a situation uh, previously before you where we had some kind of like centers of excellence or something like that within US system. That I believe it was getting funded. What, what do you know what the issue was with that? Because I'm just thinking, like, for instance, like Dave Saylor, you mentioned Dave Saylor. He's he's out there, he's he's on his own now. He's a guy who's got a wealth of experience, who's all for the US, who has a great situation of where he lives, kind of pool access, things like that. Why couldn't USA Swimming say, hey, Dave, we're going to give you 200 grand to coach whoever wants to come and swim with you, you know, in the U.S. system. And, and you're only allowed to coach U.S. athletes. Forget all the foreigners, right? Forget them. But, you know, we're going to pay you to coach our best pro athletes. Uh, is that something that's even possible in the future? I think everything's possible, right? There's no doubt. And again, he's my first boss and he's going to be my head coach. He's our head coach in Abu Dhabi. So we have, yeah, exactly. That's right. Where, so we think the world of Dave and as someone that spent lots of my years in Irvine coaching and swimming in that market, there's no doubt it's one of our best markets and places to do things. And with the Olympics coming up in 2028, Southern California is going to be very, very important to us. At the same time, we've invested significantly in our, uh, on our facilities at uh, Colorado Springs. Uh, it's been a shame that we haven't had a, a, you know, access to it because of COVID, which is a real shame for altitude opportunities. And that's primarily why we're based in Colorado Springs. And I inherited all that, right? I wasn't part of the strategy behind right, it. Right. Uh, but at the same time, again, the, the professional athletes, 
you may or may not want to swim for Dave's halo, right? God bless him. I love Dave and I would want to swim for Dave. Well, I get that. But like, couldn't we, couldn't we say, all right, we're going to put aside a million dollars. We're going to, we're going to have five athlete, different centers. No, no chance. Cause the, the athletes right now, if, if, if you told me I had to go to my national team roster and say, Hey, I'd really like you to, I'm, I'm going to invest all this money down here with Dave Salo and Irvine. You know, you also know coach, you're a coach. I mean, are you going to be really excited to send your top athletes for how long, for how many months, for how many days. I'm going to send them out here to go do that. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but again, I find that my experience on the deck at the elite, you know, and, you know, if I'm hanging out with uh, Durden or Mian or Terry McKeever or Carol Capitani or Ray Luz or any of these coaches, Greg Troy, you know, they're going to be pretty protective about their athletes as they should. They've developed cool. these athletes. They've created trust. I agree. I agree. And, 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 when, and, and as an example, Brett, is when they, when they do come to our camps, they come with them. Right. They bring their teams there. So the question might be, like, if we had a high performance somewhere else, would they want to bring their team or would they want to lend their team to Dave? They would have to be, you know, obviously technically aligned with Dave. I, we've talked about we've talked about bring, do we, should we have a coach uh, again, on premise coach in Colorado Springs? You know, we debate this all the time. Right. right. And the question becomes, do they want to do that? Or, you know, I had dinner with Greg Meehan in, in um, Greensboro. He's going to bring his team to Stan of Stanford uh, women out to Colorado Springs, which he always does over the holidays, because he wants to be there doing that, right? He and, and he wants our support. He wants Lindsay and Matt Barbini and that whole team to, to, to and Keenan Robinson and you know Carly Brashear and Stacey Michael Miller to support his athletes when they're here, which we love doing. But no, he wants to coach them and he wants to be there every day. Well, I, yes, and here, here's my thing, and and I'm talking from experience. Here. You've got the University of Florida coach coaching the two best athletes in the world right now. You got Ledecky and you got Dressel and they're both pro athletes. So that means um, not only is he coaching his men and his women, but he's, he's responsible for the two best athletes in the world who are then going to attract other great athletes. So now all of a sudden you've got a man who is a phenomenal coach, but he's coaching 80 athletes. You know, he's responsible for 80 people. He's gonna he's gonna have a nervous breakdown. I'm telling you, he's gonna have a nervous breakdown at some point. This man is a brilliant man. He's a brilliant coach. We're asking him to do too much. He's getting paid by the University of Florida, and yet here we are over here coaching the two greatest athletes in the world, who are both USA swimming. So all I'm saying is, like, yeah, we can have this situation, but there's a breaking point for this man. I guarantee you, there's a breaking point. It's gonna break his family. It's gonna break him. Some at some point you can't continue with that, you know. So it's like, but, why are we just putting the burden on him and the responsibility on him? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I think it's fair, but we're we're not. Yes, there's something he's not putting the burden on Anthony. That's no, the, I know. Well, you know, Anthony Anthony is a tremendous man. I was with him in, in Greensboro, and we had a little a lunch. Where, we had a lunch where I hosted nine coaches, and we had some great dialogue. I, I don't disagree with what the premise of the the the. the how hard being a swim coach is at an elite level, right? It's not a healthy situation. And therefore this, this past year is an example for the non university coaches that are paid pretty well to do their programs. Yeah. For the first time in the history of USA swimming, we are now offering affordable healthcare uh, and health insurance, right? Which we're very proud of that happened during COVID. We're now offering free financial uh, meetings and counseling sessions with one America for any one of our coaches or athletes that would like to do it. So we're going to continue to focus on those kind of services. But when it comes to, again, you know, private clubs, uh, you know, again, go back to my soccer example. And I apologize just because I'm, I'm so used to it. I know it so well after a decade of uh, working in those spaces. But Greg Berhalter, the manager of the U.S. national team, is paid because he is the head coach of the national team, right? They have one men's national team. Uh, they have one roster and they do it. But he does not, you know, he doesn't have anything to do when those athletes go back to their foreign club. You know, they don't, if Pulisic uh, goes back to Chelsea mm -hmm. or... Uh, you know, right here, Kellen Acosta comes back here to the Colorado Rapids. That's Robin Carlin and, and uh, the German uh, Thomas, the coach at Chelsea. That's their responsibility, right? So there's dialogue and interaction, but the accountability for the athlete is really on their, their club coach. And only when they get to U.S. soccer does Greg have these small windows of time over, over the course of an annual year that he has that kind of interaction. That's not dissimilar for us. And don't forget that when we do go to these international meets, especially if it's at the highest level world championships or the Olympic trials, sorry, Olympics rather, their yep. coaches come and do coach them, right? And because they don't want a USA resident coach, they don't want us to hire a coach that takes over those athletes. You know, and that can change if the coaching community wants to go back and say, no, no, listen, you guys, yeah, hire, hire Dave Salo and make him the resident coach and have him, you know, coach all of our athletes all the time. You know, we'd be welcome to listen to that.
Absolutely. Because again, if that's what the steering committee wants, if that's what mm -hmm. senior development wants, you know, we, we rely upon this group of individuals to direct us all the time as our nonprofit status dictates. Well, I'd love to come and talk to them about the stress that some of these college coaches are under because they might not admit it sometimes, but there's certainly a ton of stress trying to manage a, a group like that where you've got the college kids and the demand of them. And then you got these pro kids who want their own attention and, and deservedly so. So it's, uh, it, it is a challenge. So in terms of just that, you know, there's a lot of talk about athletes, mental health. Is there something within USA Swimming where we're looking at coaches' mental health as well? No, absolutely. That we, we, we started making those offerings uh, with the start of COVID as well. So the same, we have several different programs, both through USOPC. We now have a, we now have a consultant uh, who's out of the University of Michigan, former national team swimmer as well. Uh, she's available to our coaches and our athletes. Uh, we have several different other resources. We, we apply to both of them. So that's not just the college coaches or our pro mm. coaches or our national team coaches. That's to any of our club coaches as well. As I said right. a couple of minutes ago, you, you, you more so than I, but I know how, we all know how difficult this is and how hard this job is early mornings, late nights, do your work middle days, taking weekends away all day, all age groups, all levels. Uh, it is a very difficult job uh, yep. and, and, and the mental stress uh, is very difficult. So yeah, we, we're, we're providing all kinds of uh, resources to that. My, my dog just had a debacle all of a sudden. Sorry about that. F fantastic. She's sleeping and barking. I think she must be dreaming, sleeping and barking at the same time. But um, what about this? Uh, let's get away from this. I don't know why I went on that rant, by the way. That's okay. That's great. <laughs> I'm passionate about it, I guess. I love um, it. I love it. Why don't USC, Why don't we have big meets? Why don't we have FINA meets? Why don't we have world championships here? Uh, cost prohibitive. Uh, you know, I think the new regime is already working with us about trying to find ways to get to North America. Uh, but the reality is because we don't get government money, as you know, uh, and mm -hmm. we don't get it from municipalities across the country. They don't pay for our meets when we come, Brett, right? If I bring, you know, the, you know, uh, Philip 66 nationals or Philip 66 world trials, like I'm in this year, uh, they don't pay for us to come. We pay for everything, right? That's out of USA swimming's pocket to put on our largest meets. And we're very proud of these events. We've done great events. We've, uh, we continue to uh, find ways to be more commercially uh, viable. Uh, we have new hospitality ideas. We have official beer party. I mean, we're we're having more fun pre-COVID for some of these events that we've put on over the course of the last several several years, uh, at least the last four years. But the reality is, you know, for us to stroke a check for fourteen to fifteen to twenty million dollars to bring a, a world championship here uh, is untenable, and we don't have markets that are willing to support it. Yeah, fair enough. That makes sense. Is there any is there any hope in the future then, or is it, is it just the way it is? No, I think there's some other meets we might be able to partner on. You know, if there's okay. a world, we've done world juniors. We did world juniors a few years back when I first got here in Indianapolis. I think world cups, depending on what the world cup model looks like, could be something mm -hmm. that would be very interesting to us. But again, going back to your other question about professional swimming, uh, those are typically in the fall and our athletes might want to swim ISL, right? So we need to have a good conversation with our athletes that if we're willing to invest in this, is this what you want, right? Because ultimately right, right now we need to listen. Uh, I've heard loud and clear that, you know, we need to be very prepared about our consequences of making big decisions in Colorado Springs and not talking to our coaches. And we've heard that loud and clear over the last two years, which is why our committee system and this new governance system with athletes voice, I think is going to be really useful because again, it doesn't help me to go spend, you know, half a million dollars on a cheer pro event in the market that no one wants to come to. Right. So we need to be thinking about how we do things together and collaboratively. Swim Angelfish is an online certification program that strengthens your teaching curriculum to serve swimmers of all abilities. Swim Angelfish will prepare you and your instructors with the skills to teach swimmers with autism, physical disabilities, anxiety, sensory and motor conditions, and more. Learn to teach skills faster and with more comfort with Swim Angelfish. Apply for an only alpha pool product scholarship and receive up to 50% off your certification. Go to swimangelfish.com today to apply. Right. Okay. Um, I, I kind of went on a little bit of a rant a few weeks ago. I don't know if you heard any of it, but um, about the selection policy for, for world short course, you know, you've got a situation where like Coleman Stewart, for instance, current world record holder in the hundred back has left off the team. And there was, you know, he, he was upset about it. And, you know, there was, there was a lot of discussion in terms of the policy, in terms of how you pick the teams. you're about to head out to the, the world short course. Have you guys internally discussed, the policy based on the fact that there's been some noise about it, anything like that? 
Yeah, I'd certainly defer to Lindsay Mantenko. This is her responsibility, and, and she's she's going to teach me how to do these things since she's been at swimming for 15 years. Yeah, but there's there's no doubt that the conversation came up, and I think in a perfect world, we all want team selection whenever we can to be done in the water, right, and to have a, a trials or selection event. That's right. that, that's first case of scenario that we want everywhere. That's the best part of our sport, right? People get to select themselves. It's not you know subjective, right? You either beat me to the wall or you didn't. That's the bottom line. And in this particular case, short course worlds has been one of those elements that I've learned has not been of the highest priority at USA Swimming, primarily because we don't compete at 25 meters, right? So, it, you know, uh, athletes are either in 25 yards at NC2As and, and high school, and et cetera. And right now our focus and what we've heard from our coaches is they want more long course opportunities. So we've been focusing on how do we find more long course? How do we invest in quality long course racing and facilities like we did the Toyota US Open last week in Greensboro? Uh, last year, when uh, people were having trouble getting pools and waters, our senior development age group committees came to us and the national team division said, hey, help us find long course swimming. So we partnered with TIER and we came up with the TIER U18 Cup Series last year, the championship series last spring and found ways to have three or four more long course meets. So our focus is really on long course. But to go back to your question, ideally, we'd like to do things on team selection. Um, and we're going to try to work on that as we go forward. And if, if all of a sudden we realize that People now are really interested in show course worlds teams because they weren't previously based on my understanding through our national team division, right. then, then great. Then we need to figure that out. Cool. I like that. Well, that'll be good. They'll, they'll be happy to hear that because I'm sure they, they wanted some change of some sort, especially Coleman and a couple of other people that I'd talked to. Um, what about can I, this? Can I, can, I, can I say something really quick? I, yeah, I, sure. You know, one of the things I'm really passionate about, and I've, I brought this to Phoenix several years ago, and now there's a change and I'm hoping it on it. And I talked about this in soccer. I think one of my biggest passions, one of my biggest goals, for as long as I'm here or not, is we have to, in my opinion, as a global community, agree upon a global calendar, right? Mm -hmm. that, that we all know this is when we do what. Right. And one of the struggles we have right now, and I think it's hard on athletes and coaches, is that we don't have this on a consistent basis. You know, yeah, we know when Olympic trials and Olympics are going to be, but the rest of it is it's kind of hit or miss, right? Mm -hmm. We know kind of when world championships are. And I get that. We know we have this compressed three-year quad, which is super challenging, back-to-back -back long course world championships, back-to-back -back short course world championships. And then we go back to, okay, well, how do we have selection events, which puts an onus on us and our finances to figure that out for everybody so it's fair and reasonable. We got to respect the college and the college system. You know, we have nothing to do with it. We want to respect IHL, although we have nothing to do with that. So right now, not everyone's talking together. And what I'm trying to advocate as much as possible, and maybe it's a one-man whatever, but we need to have a global calendar. And that's where, again, you know, the football world gets it, right? They know mm -hmm. that they all, we all agree these are the international windows. So let's not schedule a whole bunch of other events. And there are some great events around the world, in Europe, uh, in the United States, in Australia. I mean, great events, great meets that have tremendous histories that could become even better events for potentially pros, not just development. Mm -hmm. But we have to let those people do it. And we should go support one another. I, at the end of the day, working in professional sports for 25 plus years, Brett, there is not a secret pocket of rights fees out there to spend on swimming. We're going yeah. to have to work together. We're going to have to work with FINA, our pro athletes, our coaches, our federations mm. to continue to elevate uh, you know, and amplify our sport as a sport of choice and a freaking great sport, right? Right now, there's not people hunting us down trying to give us money. And I think ISL has, has shown that. As great as that product is, as amazing as that product is, it's, mm. it's the coolest thing I've ever seen. No one is giving them money. Right. Why? Why? I don't know. So we, so maybe because we're not all working together. And and I think Brett Nowicki, I, I'm, I'm confident that he's going to get it. And, you know, I'm looking forward to the meetings next week. But in my opinion, we need to have a global calendar. So we know. So in the United States, as an example, you know, if January to May was domestic season. So that's when I do my tier pros, my junior right. nationals, NC2As all happen there. We focus on staying domestically. Then if we know that May or June to August is international windows, right? So that's kind of the friendlies. Mm -hmm. It's world championships, WUGS, world juniors, Pan Pax, uh, European championships, Commonwealth games, Asian games. And we have our trials and our events in that window. Great. And then maybe the fall is pro season, right? You know, let, let's talk about that. Or in golf, it used to be silly season, right? Like let's make sure that an NC2A startup, maybe that's, that's a place. And then all the athletes who know, I'm going to focus here, here, here. You know, so maybe it's, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm spitballing. So but, you but, want that. You want that. And that's one of your goals. But how do we get everyone else on the same page? Who, who are the players here that we need to pull in on this? 
uh, Afina first and foremost, and then okay. our. My, and well, then you got my, Mike Unger now, so you, Mike's on your side now. I, I feel good. <laughs> I feel very good about that. Uh, and then, I, and I, and quite frankly, you know, Mike did a wonderful job. Uh, you know, really, which is why he's going to be great at Fina. Mike did an unbelievable job for USA Swimming on international relations, right? And mm -hmm. so, our relationships with Australia, Japan, uh, Sweden, uh, Canada, UK, you name it, has been phenomenal. So I think we as an org we as leaders of these organizations have to get together on behalf of our federations, work with FINA, work with ISL, work with everybody and say, guys, how do we do this? It, it can't be that difficult. Other sports do it. Why can't we do it? Right, right. Fair enough. Um, you mentioned Australia a second ago, a uh, beautiful country. Um, they had a great Olympics. They, they really did. They, ha they had a good Olympics. Do you look at a nation like Australia and, and ask yourself, what are they doing well? Uh, you know, analyze them in any way. One of the areas where I feel like they're stronger than USA Swimming right now is in the area of sports science. Now, I could be wrong, but there, there's, a, there's a heavy sports science kind of um, grouping there where, where they do a lot of moving around to different club teams, working very directly with sports scientists. Um, do you feel like that's a weakness for USA Swimming or, or what are the other areas of, of strength or you know you could strengthen, you think? Yeah, definitely don't think it's a witness. Uh, Kenyon Robinson or sports medicine group, uh, the medical doctors that we have on our medical team that are around the country that are the best in the business, Dr. Scott Rodia in Manhattan, who also works with the New York Yankees and the New York Giants. Uh, Dr. Todd Kremen in UCLA works with the LA Lakers. Uh, we've got phenomenal care. So I, I think we're in great shape there. Uh, but I also agree that Australia is phenomenal at it as well. I had, I had a, my first Zoom with their new CEO yesterday, actually, mm. uh, for about 30, 35 minutes, Eugenie. And, and I think she's very excited about what they're doing. And we were eager to share each other's best practices and find ways to help each other. Because, again, uh, what I also respect about Australia is they absolutely prioritize their athletes uh, like we do. And they, they want to be great. I think we both agree that they had a phenomenal Olympic Games. And that's great for the sport. And that's great for USA Swimming because it makes us – push ourselves again. So to have any kind of rivalry is always healthy in sports. It's the most fun part about sports when you have rivalries. So I think Tokyo was a great experience. At the same time, what I enjoyed the most in my Tokyo experience was the sportsmanship between these between swimmers, right? Uh, watching, and there was not a lot of us in the venues, obviously, so you got to hear a lot, see a lot. And I, and I really loved watching, you know, Katie and, and Ariana Titmus, you know, hug each other, shake each other, you know, they, they did great. They had unbelievable swims, right? And someone won and someone got second. And that was great. And they got up and they went to the podium together, smiled together, hugged each other. I watched the relay events so closely. I was right above the blocks. And after every relay, it was so fun to watch all eight countries mm. before they left the, before they left the blocks, go around and hug or high five or say, well done to everybody regardless of the placing. And I think that's such a unique part of this. So when it comes to Australia, you know, uh, it's a great rivalry, but there's a ton of mutual respect between the nations. There's a ton of mutual respect. I absolutely um, agree with you on that. But I can tell you one thing. Australia wants to beat you. There's no <laughs> doubt in my mind. They want to beat you. And uh, and they're desperate to do it. So in that sense, knowing that, and I'm telling you that, um, I love how, it. Do we, how do we stay ahead? How does USA Swimming stay ahead? How, how do we stay that, that superpower? Uh, phenomenal question. That's what keep that's what keeps Lindsay and Teiko up at night, right? <laughs> and uh, she talks about it in their team. And I think this this first this was my first Olympics, obviously, as part of USA Swimming, and uh, got to spend a lot of time with our teams through my first trials. Uh, got to spend a lot of time with uh, Lindsay and her team, uh, and I knew they were world class. You know, so th this I was I'm very blessed to be able to give you know give Lindsay the opportunity to take over as our managing director, and I'm proud of her for winning the Olympics and. Uh, she, she makes me look good, which I really appreciate. But ultimately, she did this. Her staff does this. Again, having subject matter experts in all aspects of what they do is phenomenal. At the same time, you and I talked before we got on air today, the pipeline in the U.S. is unbelievable, right? It's the club coaches. It's our clubs that, are, that, 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 we de that deserve all the credit, right? Because, again, we don't have a coach on staff. We're not developing these athletes. We get a chance to bring these athletes in and hopefully give them a system and a technology and a sports med medicine black. Uh, uh, access that we just talked about. We give them the best tools that they can possibly be successful, the best uh, training environments when they're with us in camps. We give them the best travel opportunities, the best accommodations, uh, the best support systems we can when they're part of our national team. But ultimately, the credit goes out to the club coaches. The credit goes out to these clubs that, that I certainly have inherited. I have nothing to do with this. I mean, the, the, our committees are, you know, you talked about several coaches on this show, right? And it is hard work, but they're the ones that continue to find a way to develop these young men and women 
that continue to fill our pipeline. And Greensboro was another great example, right? You and I witnessed it, you know, firsthand, mm. right? There were young women and young men from NCAP or from you, you name it, mm -hmm. that were just doing times that you just scratch your head that in, you know, X amount of months after Tokyo in their first meet through COVID, get to Greensboro and are doing world-class best times as 14 and 16 to 17 year olds. It's, it's, a, it's phenomenal. And, you know, it keeps me up at night. We just need to make sure we don't screw it up. Always, always a pipeline, you know, great, great club coaches, um, great club system. Looking to host your first swim meet or replacing an old timing system? Run a swim meet with ease from your laptop using superior swim timing. You can use superior swim timing with your existing equipment, or they can provide you with a complete timing solution, including deck harnesses, buttons, and starter. SST is fully compatible with Hi-Tech and Team Unify, as well as Colorado, Dactronics, and Amiga touchpads. Go to superiorswimtiming.com to learn more and be sure to tell them I sent you. In terms of the, the club system, how, how do you feel about it? How would you, you feel if you were in a room of club coaches and, they were, and you were answering questions? How would you feel they felt about you and USA Swimming? Uh, in fact, it's a great question. We, Joel and I have been doing kind of a road show. We did one in Greensboro with some of these coaches. You know, I, I don't know a lot of them, right? So that's part of my purpose is I need to get out there and do a better job of getting on deck and saying hello. I think that probably 99% of them don't know uh, that I'm a coach member of USA Swimming, that I do coach, uh, that I did coach uh, at Division One. So they, 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 they know, know now because they all watch this podcast. <laughs> okay, perfect. That's, that's great. <laughs> I, have my, I have my Big West Coach of the Year plaque right there. So we there can, you go. We can have Beautiful. That. No, so I, you know, to be fair, I, you know, I need to be do a better job of getting out there and listening. And that's what the committee system is for as well. That's worked for years and years and years. So I'm, uh, the committees are now something I'm trying to spend more time on as much as possible. Uh, we've had a couple of things that have happened during my tenure that I had to address that uh, I also inherited, which I wasn't expecting, uh, like congressional hearings and so forth. But uh, the reality is we need to get out there and do more and listen more. And again, a lot of the ideas and the things we've talked about tonight of some of the new programmatic services that we're trying to deliver are all, are all coming from feedback from our coaches when it comes to mental health need, better health benefits, affordable health benefits, financial support, uh, meets in places they can get to, more long course water. Those are all coming from coaches, right? And we need to listen to them more than ever. Um, the other thing we just did, we hired a third party uh, professional PhD, former swimmer actually, which is great. And we just sent out a comprehensive uh, uh, survey out uh, to, to 3,400 coaches in the USA Swimming Coach community we had a 40 plus percent response, which is phenomenal, 1,700 completed surveys. And these were not easy surveys, they were detailed. Uh, we're getting all the data right now. So to your first question, and I'll, and I'll preview this on your show, do you trust USA Swimming? 55% yes, 25% plus somewhat, 20% no, right? And so we have work to do. Uh, and I think Joel Shinnefield, MJ Truex, and now Brendan Hansen, who's now our director of mm. uh, team services, you know, we're going to go out there and start to craft, you know, uh, our opportunities based on that input. Uh, at the same time, we lost uh, 27 full-time people in COVID. Our staff went from 100 down to 73. Oh, and wow. so, so Brendan, MJ, and Joel are about to hire uh, six more people in team services, which haven't been out there mm. uh, gripping and grinning with our coaches. And it's not an excuse, but they couldn't. There was no travel. And so right. you know, we had to make tough decisions and we had some people move on to, to greener pastures. So uh, we're, we're excited about building that back for this quad, uh, but we're going to do our very best. And, and my commitment is to be as accessible as ever uh, and listen as much as we can, because again, as a nonprofit dollar in dollar out, you know, we, we we're, every dollar we get, we have to spend, you know, so we need to know where to spend it. And the best place is to listen to the people that do this every single day as professionals. Well, uh, that's good to know. I'm sure a lot of people are happy to hear that. And in terms of the accessibility, I'll be the first to say, I sent you a text, asked if you'll be on the show. You gave me options. And one of the options was like two days from now. Yep, let's do it. So you were great. You didn't ask me what questions I was going to ask. None of that. So in terms of the, the you know, um, just being accessible, uh, you, you certainly are. So you, you've proven that. I appreciate that. Um, kind of biggest news in the world of swimming right now, I guess, is Leah Thomas and the situation with, um, you know, her being transgender and, and uh, performing at uh, the collegiate level and, and swimming really fast times. Uh, what's the stance on, on this with USA Swimming? Well, currently she's not a member of USA Swimming. 
uh, and hasn't been for more than two years. So as of right now, again, that situation is not technically in our remit today. But clearly, uh, if she continues to swim well, and let's say she gets an American record, well, right. then, then we're going to need to get involved right, to talk about that. Currently, right now, the way we work at an elite level is we defer to the IOC's uh, uh, language and mandate as it, as it pertains to transgender athletes. And then they defer to FINA. So right now, it's, it's in FINA's quarters, first and foremost. But I can tell you that talking to them this week, uh, it'll be on the agenda next week, and we will be meeting with that group. Uh, they're going to uh, go out and get the best possible, I think, subject matter experts, medical experts, and, and have some real conversations because this is uh, this is an important topic for all all of us to address, and we can't wait on it. Yeah, I agree on that. And and look, I've I've stayed away from it myself. I, first of all, I I I feel for her. You know, honestly, I do. But at the same time, I understand the heat. You know, like you swim that fast, you're gonna you're going to have, you're going to have a divide, you know? And um, so there's certainly that. And I think, look, she, she is the first, but I don't think she's going to be the last. So it's certainly an issue that we're going to have to look to in the future for sure. So the fact that you are looking at it and going to address it is something that I think is certainly necessary. Well, and, and not only that, you know, we, at least from a USA swimming perspective, have a tremendous goal of being as inclusive of as possible, right? right? And we we pride ourselves in trying to be the highest standard of that and everything that we do. So there's no question we need to be we need to have a voice in this. And and for us to pretend like we don't would be would be foolish. Right. In terms of the mental health aspect, going back to that real quick, we've always had kind of um, sports psychologists. Is there is there a place now for a psychiatrist? You know, for people. You know, really. Uh, at the doctor level to travel with teams on a permanent basis or maybe even be within USA Swimming? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, like I said, uh, we, we have contracted with somebody uh, right now to be that person mm. for USA Swimming's national team division. Uh, we have people that are talking about in our major committees. We have access to resources that we provide. But yeah, I, I think we absolutely can and should. Uh, I'll tell you what, the number one person uh, in addition to Michael Phelps, of course, the number one person on our staff uh, that talks about this and has made this her mission is Lindsay Mantenko. And, uh, you know, it, and again, it's, it's, it's much easier for me to listen to somebody that is a two-time gold medalist uh, that's been around the sport. That's the mother. You know, we're both parents in the sport as well. You know, she went to her daughter's first high school meet last week before juniors. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to a, a swim meet tomorrow for my three sons, you know, so we care about this at all levels. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, I, I think that's a reasonable uh, question and something that we're absolutely committed to. Well, your last thing I've kept you off. I appreciate your time. You're you're about to head off to the the World Shore Course. So, what's your expectations? What's your hopes of this this team? Uh, I'm excited about it. It's a nice mix of of our national team athletes, some young athletes. Lydia Jacoby will be there. So it's, hmm. it's and she's an incredible personality. She won two golden goggles this week and 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 just w spoke eloquently. Uh, thanking her teammates and her people and obviously from Alaska and, and mm. just what a great story that is. Um, yeah. We've got great veterans coming, which I'm excited about. So I think it's going to be a great team and uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone will be going after us as always, but our intention is to win the meet, right? That's, that's Lindsay's intention. That's our team's intention. Coach Salo did a wonderful job with our team in 2018. And to your point earlier, he's always got the USA front in mind, which I've always respected and liked about Dave. So I think we're going to do very well. I think the facilities from what I understand are phenomenal. I've never been to the Middle East, uh, so I'm excited about that. I'm actually traveling with our new, brand new board chair, Chris Brereton. I uh, had his first meeting this last week. Uh, Chris uh, is a former swimmer, swam for Jack Bowerly. Uh, mm. He's a couple years younger than me. I'm an old 53. Uh, his son is swimming at Georgetown this year, uh, and he's currently running the MGM Studios. So he's a phenomenal experience on the commercial and, and sports entertainment. And by the way, FINA has tapped him to help grow the sport on some of their committees. So I'm excited to be there with them and have some good meetings. And for the first time in the history of USA Swimming, both the board chair and CEO are former swimmers and current parents of swimmers. That's awesome. Well, listen, don't let Phoenix you know, put their, their claws into him either. <laughs> don't no. lose him. I won't. Um, I, won't. I promise. Uh, listen, Tim, I appreciate this. Thank you for doing this on a whim and just uh, answering all my um, terrible questions. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Now, listen, they're great questions. They're all top of mind right now. They're all really important to our sport. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we certainly don't have all the answers yet, but I can tell you that we're super committed to it. I'm really proud of our team. We've got a great group now uh, in Colorado Springs, uh, you know, and, and just something that we're never going to lose sight of what's most important, which is our athletes. 
Well, listen, I, I got to tell you, um, I'm an American now, but I, I grew up Australian. I represented Australia at two Olympics. You were always um, the standard, you know, it was always USA swimming was the standard. And I don't think that has changed in the slightest. So um, you're doing a phenomenal job, tough job. Uh, but you know, you've got my full support, so keep it up and, um, thanks for everything you do. Okay. No, I really appreciate it. I I'm just so proud to be here. Blessed to be here. I love this sport. So thank you. All right. Take care, Tim.